everywhere where um, government and uh, corporate interests have aligned, which is basically the entirety of our society, um, mm -hmm. you can find abuse. You can find, you know, a system that anybody with objective reason would look at and say, well, this isn't, you know, a system designed to benefit. You know, this is not a system designed, as I mentioned before, to benefit everybody that's involved with it. This yeah. is a system that's designed in, you know, in an abusive manner to suck value out at the top end. And you say that you think there is such a thing as ethical capitalism? Yeah, I, I, I do. Yeah, so hiya. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me on, by the way. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, yeah, I think, do you know what? I think you touched on it right there with the way that you um, phrased that is, I think we live in a very polarized society where mm -hmm. I think people often think something is a force for good or it's a force for evil. I generally, I do use the phrase ethical capitalism. But generally, I try and avoid the isms, if you know what I mean, because <laughs> I think people get very bogged down, especially in the modern society, well, historically as well, uh, with, you know, the, the, the sort of dividing lines between these ideologies, you know, capitalism, Marxism, socialism. Um, I, I use the word ethical capitalism. Uh, when I use that phrase, I'm normally referring to my businesses. Um, I'm normally referring to sort of the way in which Uh, we handle the concepts of profit, the way in which we handle the concepts of abundance, you know, making, um, generating value all the way up the chain. You know, that's, that's what I normally mean by ethical capitalism, um, you know, making the process of commerce, making the process of the exchange of value, um, you know, not abusive, making it, um, you know, uh, one that is sustainable on every level, you know, that somebody from the customer that buys the product, they feel like they're getting value beyond just perceived value. You know, if you buy something like, I don't want to say any like luxury brand names, you know, there's different types of value. Somebody can get value from something um, because it's a brand that they really love, or they can get value something because they feel that they're getting a lot of value in the actual content of the product. Um, we try and give value on every level, you know, from the interaction with the customers um, to the actual physical product that you get, um, you know, it, but of course, To be a business, it has to be profitable. It has to be sustainable. It, you know, we try to give as much value on every level to our, you know, to our staff, to our suppliers, you know, where we get our ingredients from, for example. It's all, it has to be a compassionate process that works for everyone, you know, along the chain. So it's benefiting everyone. Right. Um, but of course, within that, you know, to be able to have what I would call an intelligent application of benefit, you know, where we're actually making something where we're not just, Uh, you know, selling products and, oh, you know, somebody loves a product and, oh, you know, the, the farmer is really happy because they get a good price and they get to do it in a way that's positive. It has to work. It has to work along the whole chain. The company has to make money so we can continue to, you know, demonstrate that this is something that people want. Yeah. This is what people want now. People want a business with conscience. People want a business that um, is transparent about their processes and actually you know, aims to be conscientious and to, and to provide benefit for everyone. So that, <laughs> I don't know if that was a bit waffly, but that's, that's kind of in a nutshell what I, I, I believe it. No, that was a really good introduction. I think for me, I became aware of it um, when a few years ago. So I, I didn't go to university until just a few years ago and where I studied politics then. But before that, you know, I just had various jobs and didn't really think too much about brands. So I didn't think about the supply chain and how it is, for example, that when I came to live here, a, you know, a, a brand like Primark or H&M, the difference in value prices. And I didn't, I, I didn't grow up with, you know, there's too many consumer products. I didn't grow up with Nike or any of these brands. Yeah. So I wasn't really exposed to a lot of the conversations that were happening around exploiting child labor. I didn't really have any of that access mm. to that until someone said, you know, well, what you're wearing, it was a snide comment uh, <laughs> that someone made about uh, ethical capitalism, where they said, you know what, a lot of the brands you wear exploit Uh, mm. labor and a lot of them use child labor and the thought of me wearing something to enhance my life while a child somewhere else was being abused was mm. just so horrific to me 
And the fact that we continue to have these conversations is still kind of jarring. I don't understand how we are still here. When you look back in the <laughs> 80s, people were talking about Nike. And yeah. how is it first of all possible that there can be, the mm. other day, for example, Mango uh, was caught out because um, I think the, the, the staff posted, I don't know, are you aware of this? I, yeah, I heard about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So can you talk to me about how it's possible that a big brand can still today get away with not providing water for their yeah. <laughs> So it's a, it's a really good question. The reason I'm smiling, uh, kind of laughing to myself, is because I think uh, without obfuscating the entire issue, um, we're going to be looking back at this period of history, I'm certain of this, but it's already happening, in about, hopefully, <laughs> 10 to 20 years. Um, and they're going to be making Netflix documentary after Netflix documentary about how we lived in a society that could exist in this current state. Um, and it's not just from brands, it's not, it, it, it's, you know, we look at across the board, we look at the energy crisis, we look at the housing crisis, we look at the, you know, what's happened with COVID, we look at the sort of, you know, the, the disparagency between, you know, the vaccine uptake of, you know, wealthy countries and, and the less economically developed countries. Uh, we look at um, the class divide, we look at the punitive system, you know, we look at all of these measures, all of everywhere where um, government and uh, corporate interests have aligned, which is basically the entirety of our society, mm -hmm. um, you can find abuse. You can find, you know, a system that anybody with objective reason would look at and say, well, this isn't, you know, a system designed to benefit. You know, this is not a system designed, as I mentioned before, to benefit everybody that's involved with it. This yeah. is a system that's designed in, you know, in an abusive manner to suck value out at the top end. Yeah. Um, and what's happening with a lot of these big brands is because they can only get away with so much publicly. So when you have a, when you have a brand that's what I would call this, I won't go into a whole because I could go talk about that for a while, but there's three different things that generally uh, a company offers to their consumers. It's value. So obviously, you know, a great price. Um, it's customer experience or it's innovation. You can't have all three. <laughs> Any good business person knows that you can't have all three of those things, you know? Uh, you can't be Apple and McDonald's at the same time. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you can't offer the innovation and the customer experience and the value. So generally we find that a lot of the abuses like that will happen on the value side of things. And it happens across the board, you know, even Apple, every business is trying to get their prices down for the consumer. Mm -hmm. So what you have as a consumer is you have a system where you're, made to feel like you're on the pedestal do you know what i mean you're put on the pedestal the value is being passed to you right mm -hmm. you're not the one that's being abused in the situation mm -hmm. because you're getting a great deal you're getting a you know a, a, a quality garment at a certain price or you're getting you know a fantastic product from apple or you know whatever and, and you feel great about that where they can shroud the process of everyone else involved you know along that supply chain uh, and they'll look at it and they'll think, and I don't, you know, I don't want to put words in the mouth of any of any companies. And I'm sure that as time goes on, they're all trying to move away from this. But the issue is that the whole system is rigged. When you're competing with, it's like Lance Armstrong's yellow jackets. Do you know what I mean? He was, uh, you know, he would say, well, I won all those Tour de France's because everybody was doping. Do you know what I mean? Everybody was doing what I was doing. Yeah. And I had no chance if I didn't, Right. Right. You say you say kind of you say kind of fair enough in, in an element. So the question then goes, you know, where does the responsibility lie? Yeah. I think the person that called you out for your shirt is not helping the issue. Do you know what I mean? Like if they did it in a positive way, that's fine. But I, I don't believe that the responsibility is on the consumer. And I think the same thing for um for like renewable energy, you know, for global warming. I think that people, it's another way of again obfuscating the issue by um putting the blame on you know the individual. By putting the blame on somebody that really, I know collectively we have the ability to make change, but when the system doesn't uh, even allow us to, you know, organize at the moment and meet, that ain't going to happen, is it? So it's all, it, it's all polarizing again, you know, it's like, let's make, you need to be responsible for what you buy. You need to be responsible for where you buy, you know, the, 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 the blue tick uh, on the tuna and stuff, you know, you yeah. need to be aware, bollocks, sorry, I don't know if I'm going to <laughs> but, but such, such bollocks, like even the companies, even the, co even the companies, like I feel like to an element, like what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to set an example that like you can do business this way and people will vote with their wallet. You know, people will actually recognize that you're doing that and they will, they will fight for your brand because they feel that you represent them. 
Yes. Even then, if you're a giant corporation with shareholders and stakeholders, you remember these aren't individuals run by one person. It's right. it's it's a, it's a system of abuse in its own in its own right, you know, because you've got somebody who's a CEO who's maybe just come in, he's lived a whole life groomed for this position, and now he has these quotas to meet, he has these targets to meet, and he's going to be out the door in five. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. We're we're always very quick to look at a person. We want to put a face to a problem. You yeah. Know I mean? We want to say yeah, that was this guy. But the issue is that these problems are faceless. You know, these problems are systemic. These problems are at the government level and the regulatory level at the policy level. Mm -hmm. The issue is, is that nobody's sitting down and actually thinking of how to provide an intelligent application of benefit. You know, we look at the world and we think there's so much money, there's so much wealth, you know, there's so much opulence. <laughs> um, surely we can we can create a system where a single mother who works a 50 hour, 60 hour week and has three children and busts her ass doing one of the hardest jobs on the planet, like cleaning up after people, cleaning other people's filth, you know, going into a disgusting toilet, something that make any of us feel sick. Do you know what I mean? But she does it and she doesn't complain about it. The fact that that person cannot comfortably provide for their family is a disgrace, you know, right. and anybody can look at that in that way. And I feel that in modern society, we're so focused on putting faces on problems you know mm -hmm. of saying well she's not working hard enough oh well she should have gone to university oh well she should have... if that's their problem do you know what I mean like in my individual bubble I've got what I've got and anything outside of that anybody that's got less is trying to take something from me do you mm -hmm. know what I mean that's the, the illusion that we live in at the moment so I think your question was how does this how is this allowed to happen a myriad of reasons, a complex circus of individualism and corporate greed and capitalism and, and crony uh, capitalism of like poli political, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Where, you know, uh, you're just trying to climb the ladder. Yeah. Everybody's distracted on themselves and not, you know, and, and told to blame the person next to them for something, you know, because it will distract from their own responsibility. The conversations for me that happen within my peers is... Mm -hmm really ge generational so it's oh you know sure. had these conversations before you know we were once young idealists ourselves <laughs> yeah <laughs> tried to create a system that works for everybody oh all these young utopianists mm -hmm. will kind of understand what's going to happen in 10 years they will be the jaded ones who mm -hmm. give up on creating an equitable system yeah. Um, so that's kind of the conversations that I think people who are who've been mm -hmm. where you are are, and so they look at everyone who's young who thinks that they that can be a more fairer society. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? The hippies had the same conversations. Yeah, we're just talking about something new, but it's already been said and done. What do you say yeah. to, to old, jaded, cynical people? <laughs> I, I, I say, uh, what do I say to the old jaded cynical people? I say, watch and wait. <laughs> That's what I say. I say, watch and wait. Um, because I think if, if I think people love to, I think what you said is so true. People love to look at the period of history that they're in now, you know, that they didn't grow up in and go, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's not as good as it was before. It's not. But I think, uh, you know, objectively, we can look at history and say, we've been progressing right like constantly we've been progressing from where we were you know in the 1800s 1700s you know we look at just from a human rights perspective from a you know from a from a responsibility from an ability to live your life with an element of freedom and and you know and for people to be able to take uh sovereignty for themselves you know what i mean all of these kind of things that we have as these individualistic uh but also sociological goals yeah. We're, we're clearly moving towards them. Obviously, you can't you can't look at society and say we're not, right? Well, if I'm honest with you, when Obama was becoming president, and I, you know, originally from Kenya, I was walking around. <laughs> <laughs> this is our house now. <laughs> Everything's changed. <laughs> Finally, we get to show you how. Yeah. Things would be if we were running the show, we would all sure. live happily ever after. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I grew up with, you know, Nelson Mandela. After, after all his suffering, he came yeah. up and created a system or tried to create a system that just forgave everybody for whatever they did in the past. And so mm. I, I was like, I think we should always want things because we would never take it yeah. out on you. 
we would, we would, you know, we're just more soulful people. We, we would own them. It's our like identity. And I was walking yeah. up saying, change and hope has come to the world. Mm-hmm. I, and, and the older, the people who were older than me were so, I literally remember one of my uh, friends yeah. saying, I, I am so envious of your naivete. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, just the, how hopeful you are. I wish I had that. I remember that. And so they were always talking about how hopeful they were in the 60s. Yeah. But do you know what the beauty yeah. is of that? Of that is that every single new generation will have that. And every single new generation will enter into a world where that hope can flourish more um, bountifully. I'm trying to think of the word for it. <laughs> and that's, I don't believe that. I, I really, really, really do believe that. I have, I have nothing but positivity for the progression of the human race. Honestly, I see all of the, um, in, in psychotherapy, you have a theory called uh, breakdown to breakthrough. So the idea that, you know, any positive change that's ever come in your life generally normally comes after a breakdown. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> normally you're crying, you're, you know, oh, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't. But then, you know, the, the, the day dawns and suddenly you realize that, you know, there's more to life. There's growth. You know, I've learned something from this. You know, I move forward. And I think that as a society, we're, we're in that phase right now. I see global warming. I see Trump. I see all of these, uh, all of, you know, the racism in the football, all of this kind of stuff. I see that as the, you know, the grumblings of the breakdown, you know, the bubbling of the cauldron as it transitions, honestly. Uh, and I think it's really positive science. Too. But yeah. my problem is I have believed that always. And there yeah. are people who remind me, do you remember yeah. when, so I, I'm originally from Somalia. Yeah. And every time I would get someone to say, hey, do you know there's a new president? And I would be like, I would say, oh, he seems yes. to just what we need. And so, or, or, you know, with every Kenyan politician that just the with a rhetorician and yeah. think, oh, this is it. Finally, we are, we are, we are getting there. But I think the older you get, the more disappointed you become. The more think, you feel like, yeah. maybe I don't get politics. Maybe I just don't get it. And you start to lose hope and feel like maybe we will always be that, you know, where yeah. we'll make a few steps forward. And we will, we will be reborn. Our mm-hmm. hope will be reborn. But every time it feels like our dark forces, our impulses yeah. are always ready to, you know, diminish whatever progress that we make. I'll, gi- I'll give you a, like, um, I'll give you kind of like a, not an analogy, I'll give you kind of an imagery, the kind of the way I think about this, because I understand what you're saying. In terms of change, in terms of like, um, you know, the amalgamation of like progress, if we look at it, if we look at like a microscopic level, Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to see conflict, right? You're always going to see conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, So if, for example, if, if we, if we looked at the world as a big, you know, ball right now, you know, we zoom down in space and we're sorry for any flat earthers watching. Um, (laughs) We're going to go with the traditional concepts here, but we're open to any, (laughs) but we're going to go with the sphere for now, if that's all right. So, uh, you know, and it's rotating, sorry. Uh, (laughs) And we're looking at it from space and let's imagine, you know, uh, we sort of pinpointed any, moment on it we zoomed right down to that moment down to the human level down to the you know um you know literally just people walking past each other and in that moment you'll see the exchange of negative and positive you'll see a homeless person having a connection with somebody that doesn't know them and we'll see you know if we could if we could visualize let's say the positive was blue and the negative was red you'd see that energy you know come off of that individual interaction and then you'd see somewhere else someone arguing with somebody or something, someone having a fight with someone. And obviously we see a negative interaction and we look down, we see chaos, you know, we just see positive, negative, but generally we normally notice the negative. Do you know what I mean? So we probably see a lot of shit going on and we feel a bit oppressed by this. Let's say we zoomed in on Syria or a war-torn country. You're going to see a lot of suffering. You're going to see a lot of awful, awful things going on. You're going to see a lot of unfairness that will make you think, fuck, Oh, sorry, I don't know if I'm going to be swearing again. Uh, you know, how, how is this world moving forward? Where, you know, as I think it was Martin Luther King, wasn't it, that said an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere, right? Um, you know, how can we move forward? But I'm of the theory that if we zoomed out and we were able to see the world as a whole picture, we were able to see all that blue and all that red, all that green, whatever colour you want to make it, I think you see harmony. 
Mm-hmm. I really do. Mm-hmm. I think that people are very obsessed with the concepts of positivity, the concepts of, um, you know, um, light and dark, evil and good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it goes down to a very deep psychological level, even to ourselves. You know, I think this causes a lot of human suffering within ourselves, this concept that we're either a good person or a bad person. Mm-hmm. Again, polarization, you know. Um, and I think that we all need to awaken to the fact as a society and as individuals that there is no separation between the light and the dark. You know, we are we are beautiful souls. We are incredible, um, you know, the most beautiful thing that the universe has ever produced, you know, the universe perceiving itself. But we're also have all the power of destruction, all that power of negativity. You know, we have that within us. Mm-hmm. But that's the same as the universe itself. It's the same as the world itself. Mm-hmm. We all have the propensity to be the best versions of ourselves or the worst versions of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And we exist in those forms every day. Mm-hmm. But we only choose to focus on the positive or, you know, really fetishize the negative that we lose any concepts of ourselves, not just as individuals, but also as connected beings. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, and I'm going on a very grand sort of long way around explaining to your point. But oh, I need really the macro room. perspective. Sure. I mean, without the macro, exactly. the micro doesn't make any sense, right? No, and it never will. And it never will. Because let me tell you why it will never make sense. Because you can go through London, hopefully this will change one day, and you'll walk past five beautiful, perfect human beings sitting there in the darkness, completely shrouded in darkness. They, they have no concept of their own light anymore. They don't believe. And that's, you know, this is what a lot of people don't understand about homeless people is that, or, or drug addicts or anybody that is generally frowned upon by, by society is that you pass a lot of judgment to them. Believe me, they pass enough onto themselves. <laughs> that's that's why they're there. Is because they don't believe that they are worth not being there. And when we punish them by saying, "Oh, get a job, do this, whatever," but as soon as we realise on the macro level that we're all connected, you know, that we're all have the potential to be in each other's position. You know, I could be standing here, the one giving the, a fiver to a homeless man. I could, if I was born in a different life. If I was born with different, um, you know, cognitive abilities, different uh, propensities, different, you know, needs, if I was abused, anything, any, any single little different thing happened in my life, I could be sitting where that man could be sitting. And I think as soon as we recognize that and yeah. we all start trying to stand on each other's heads to feel taller, yeah. um, I think that, and I think we are, and I think that is happening. Mm-hmm. I think that is happening. I think that we are, as a con- global consciousness, we are becoming more empathetic and more aware that we're not, you know, we're not in a bubble, that actually one of the most rewarding feelings you can ever have is going and talking to that homeless person and, and actually connecting with them and, and making them realize they aren't alone. And then tell you what, when you walk away, you'll feel a light in your side of yourself that you, you know, nothing else can give you. And more people realize that, you know, as time goes on. And I was speaking with a, um, a lovely girl that I met um, over the weekend and she's, I, I didn't, I would never have thought this of this girl, but today she's, she's taking a blind person for a walk and she's uh, on a Zoom, she's got Zoom with, ho- uh, not homeless people, with, um, with old, you know, people in old people's homes. And this is the new generation. It's, this is, I'm telling you, this is, this is what it's going to be like now. These, this new generation of people are so sensitive, sad for them, because <laughs> it's a hard world, um, but they are very connected and they're very empathetic. And I feel like social media and this kind of stuff has potentially played a part in that because they're, you know, we live in an age of information where we have access access to you know there's no excuses now not to be informed of issues of you know of movements of anything and this new woke generation that people love to say that like it's a nasty thing <laughs> you know obviously there's going to be teething problems obviously there's the whole social justice war social justice warrior thing all that kind of stuff but you know whatever um i think that again if you look at it from a macro level you look at the progression of society from thousands of years we look at you know the fact that you know um, from slavery to the, you know, to women's rights to vote, to, you know, to um, homosexual rights, to transgenderism, all this stuff, all this, you know, we've made huge leaps in all these things. And a lot of them in the last, you know, sort of like few decades. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if we look at it from macro level from the new generation that are coming through, sure, they've got an absolute, not, I wouldn't even say like a, you know, a, a, an, a, a difficult situation, let's say, <laughs> to inherit. But if they weren't born into that difficult situation, they wouldn't be conscious of it. You understand? They, 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 wouldn't, they wouldn't be conscientious. They wouldn't be going out and protesting and marching and all this stuff if they weren't born into a situation where they were like, hang on a minute, <laughs> someone's got to do something about this, you know? Yeah. And that's why I believe we have, to, we have to break down, we have to go down before we can ascend, you know? And that's where I think we are now. I, people look at your generation and think that the obsession with labels, pronouns, 
is kind of distracting to them. But I believe that all of this is just media hype and confusion yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that is trying to obfuscate the fact that the younger generation are just mad about the inequities that we have in our society. They're mad about the fact that this has been allowed to carry on as long as it yeah. has carried on, given the tools that we have in this time. Tell yeah. me. Well, uh, they are frustrated. I think, well, firstly, the first thing I'll say is that uh, we, I think we, we know now we live in an age where the media is like a kind of like a running joke, you know? <laughs> I watch a few like online. Uh, I'm a fan of the Young Turks. I don't know if you're familiar with them. So I, I know a lot more about American politics than I do about British politics simply because... I watch that channel and I find them really engaging and, and objective. Um, and even then, though, to be fair, I don't love the fact that they they identify as a left wing channel because I, you know, like I said before, I don't really believe in left wing, right wing, you know, yeah. progressive, pragmatic. I think middle. That's what we want to be. Right. And I don't mean centrist. <laughs> I spoke a while ago saying I don't have a wing. I'm not a chicken. You know, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And if and if a plane only had one bloody wing, then it would be going around in circles, wouldn't it? So let's think about that. <laughs> <laughs> let's think about that for a second <laughs> um so sorry to answer your question so um i think like i said the first thing is that we you can't trust the way anything's portrayed in the media you know you look at the protests in london um you know and it's very clear that the media are hand in hand with the government who are hand in hand with big business and it's you know the status quo is profitable in that system you know that system that we have at the moment um so anything that's going to challenge the status quo is going to be resisted um so of course you know, the young people are being portrayed in the same way as, you know, these recent protests in London are. They focus on the amount of arrests. They focus on the disruption. They say, uh, you know, you know, if you watch BBC, it's like, you know, the protest was made up by several different groups, you know, all with different, you know, whatever. And it's like, you know, they're, they're trying to make out like there's no, there's no unity, right? So let's not, you know, forget the media. <laughs> don't, worry, don't worry about the media. Yeah. But I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. Obviously, you can believe some stuff in the media, but young people, the only way you're going to get the, to measure the sort of the tone of what young people feel is by talking to them, you know, is by actually going out, engaging with them, talking with them. And what you'll find if you do that is um, you'll find that they're generally extremely conscientious, intelligent, educated, fair people that don't lead with uh, individualistic needs. They're actually willing to sacrifice large swathes of their own life, like their childhood out fighting for the greater good, you know, and it's quite beautiful. Um, I think that, you know, it, I think that people like to belong, people want to belong. And I think that the younger generations have found really worthwhile causes um, to attach themselves to, to bond together, to put their energy into. And I think it's, I think it's amazing. And I think that, you know, we look at someone like Greta Thunberg, who is just, you know, absolutely, the way people talk and treat Greta Thunberg is just, it's, it's just vile, isn't it? So and you, some leaders, I mean. Yeah. But it's exposing, isn't it? It's exposing. You know, you look at you look at all these kind of like right wing talking heads um, who some of whom I watch, you know, uh, some, you know, I like to always get, an, a, you know, like a, a full picture of an opinion. And I think everybody should. I don't think that you should follow one person or whatever. I think you should always see what the other side is saying. Um, but I just personally feel like this is from my own perspective. We've gotten to a place in society where the the twisting of facts, you know, facts can be so misleading, right? I think Ben Shapiro has a famous, uh, a, a famous saying, uh, facts don't care about your feelings, right? That's, and it's like, this is like the right wing thing people will say, facts don't care about your feelings, you know? But facts are the most misleading <laughs> things ever, you know? If you take a fact out of context, uh, then you can form any kind of opinion that you want, you know? And that's the world that we live in right now, is that, you know, People take sound bites and facts and they present them with a specific, a completely, completely subjective argument that like the pushes people to a certain ideology or polarizes people. And then the idea is they just have us all arguing, you know, <laughs> instead of any real change, we're all just arguing about absolute nonsense <laughs> and not moving forward. Absolutely. And that's what people worry about at how yeah. easy it is to manipulate, mm -hmm. um, you know, the young. But, sorry to interrupt. I think you'll find that a lot of that polarization, a lot of that is occurring. And I don't want to 
you know pit generations against each other but when i talk to people mm-hmm. you know the appetite for conspiracy theory for example you know i think it's very good to have a healthy uh, skepticism of the status quo i certainly do um but at the same time um you know you, you talk to certain people and i generally find that if these people are you know sort of a uh, sl- slightly older age it's like they have an inkling of what the young people have but then they're like it goes so far the other way because they've lived their whole life you know kind of in the safe system of like this is what we've been told and the media you know can be trusted i think young people have been exposed to it more early so they've got like a healthy skepticism whereas a lot of older people that kind of suddenly realize that 80 percent of the stuff you're being told maybe isn't so you know so accurate and actually you're kind of being used for corporate and governmental gains mm-hmm. they're like q <laughs> you know oh god they're all pedophiles they're all you know satanists and it's just mental you know yeah. <laughs> it's a fine line <laughs> but it does it does feel like there's almost extreme groups everywhere mm. yeah, yeah, yeah i i my sense is that the extreme groups are the most vocal ones and that everybody who is kind yes. of a moderate just thinks yes. you know what sooner or yeah. later you tire yourself out and realize yeah. you're just you've been chasing your own tail <laughs> yeah we call that the vocal minority we call that what do you think of the fact that a lot of companies are now they have ESG goals mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then there's all these ideas being floated around of actually they're just greenwashing when they embrace climate or yeah. when they embrace, you know, LGBTQ issues, yeah. that's pinkwashing. That's good, I've never heard pinkwashing before. I like that. <laughs> My sense is that there are companies who, for one reason or another, you know, sometimes just mo- momentum, you know, mm-hmm. and- of course that comes in and this is how things are done and they don't really critically question anything sometimes it's just that people came to work for a company they thought was you know ethical and yes. a, 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 a fair business mm-hmm. and you know it just turns out that in some ways somewhere along their supply chain there's as you do you have a manager who's cutting corners because they're trying to be more profitable yeah. and to get more of the bonus for themselves and it's just all of these things mm-hmm. and so the checks and balances are eroded and that kind of thing so i try yeah. and give companies also that are trying to do good you know some leverage so for example on my website i um I'm trying to become profitable myself. You know, I, I too, I'm a business. And so I've started like working with affiliates uh, like Nike, for example. And then you hear all these things about how Nike is, you know, exploiting people still and it hasn't changed. Yeah. You know, I don't want money from a company that is not that kind of thing. And then, so then I go and look and it looks like they've made this new commitment and they've given 18.6 million to women's causes. And then, Mm -hmm. okay, you know what? If they're going to embrace the values that are important in this time, then maybe I I can continue to do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think, no, I really do. I think that, I think you've made a really, I think you've made a really, really interesting point there. Like a really interesting point. I think that is where a lot of people get stuck. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get stuck on that because we can't have, we can't all be Puritans, right? you know, right. And, And especially in the face of, corporate uh you know these massive corporations that are you know larger than governments and but we're expected to be you know the growing small businesses are expected to be puritans <laughs> <Do they? laughs> we're not even allowed to collaborate with the larger right and and, and that's a system that was that will not get anyone anywhere <laughs> so i think that, that there's a couple of questions of what you asked ask, ask there so i think the first one was about corporate responsibility um and i think that was a really interesting point again um, I think people love to think when they think about like Coca-Cola or they think about any of these kind of companies, um, they think they love to think of like Dr. Evil, do you know what I mean? Like sitting in his chair, sort of like putting lasers on sharks <laughs> and thinking about ways that they can, you know, like let's how much more palm, how much more palm can we plant? How much of the Amazon can we rip up today? Like obviously that's not the truth. Do you know what I mean? Like, of course, we have to have a system of transparency. That's the main thing. I think that's the main thing. It's a system of checks and balances, a system where there's um, consumer respons- responsibility to the consumer, where we can have some kind of, you know, checks and balances and everything is made available to us where we can say, okay, you know, 
we don't need your PR stunts. <laughs> do you know what I mean? We don't need you to do all this stuff, which by the way, I don't think it's a bad thing. Greenwashing, pinkwashing, like jump on the train. Yeah, fine. If, if you can make money from something positive, then do it. Do you know what I mean? Like better than what? Like let's start, let's get them sponsored by the KKK or something. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, like what's the alternative? Right. Let's greenwash. It's fine. As long as you're not doing damage, you know, like, yes. and, and as long as we have the opportunity, like I said, for, consumers to call out companies that's what you want that's what you want let them greenwash and then let there be checks and balances um, and regulations where you know if people are falling short of those new expect expected um standards then um then basically you know we can call them out on that and i like to describe businesses as ecosystems you know like when i start a business it's like i start a little village somewhere do you know what i mean i've got my staff i've got my people and like you know i'm responsible for the village of course like i want to make money but you know sucking all the value out of the business out of the out of the village is going to leave the people living there destitute and nobody's going to want to live there and they're not going to enjoy living there and do you know what i mean so i i personally believe that um and i think this has been shown in regular uh, regulations especially with like punitive systems and government and stuff for like rehabilitation of drug addicts etc when you invest in people when you when you invest in people emotionally uh financially um you know and also then physically you give them the ability to not you know like you know healthcare you invest in the ability to feel you know like a, a gym for example we have a gym at my at my <laughs> at my offices and stuff um you know when you invest in people on those levels yeah. it pays dividends right it's this is it, yeah right it's it, it's 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 profitable. It's profitable to, to care about people. It's profitable to invest in people, you know? Um, anyway, that's a whole other thing. I'm going to answer your question because I could go, I could talk about that for ages. So, but in terms of your responsibility as a, as a growing business, mm -hmm. again, I feel like this is a false dichotomy of responsibility that government, that the, um, that everywhere is pointing at the little guy and saying, you, what are you doing about it? <laughs> you know, the world is burning. What are you doing about it? Hey, you, look at you with your can of Coke. Like, <laughs> what is, what's your philosophy in terms of business? How did it reconcile making sure that your business is profitable and you're growing and you're scaling while yeah. also making sure that the people that work for you are growing with you? Yeah, hundred percent. So um, I think for me, um, the two things go hand in hand. Like I, I, it's not for me, it's not like uh, that they are competing objectives. And I think a lot of people think they are. A lot of people think like profit, you know, means I can't invest. It means I can't invest in people. It means I can't, you know, do all these things. I, you know, I'd love to do all this. Oh, but I've got to make money. I've got to make profit. Right. Um, my feeling and, and I and sorry, it's not a feeling I, I, without sounding braggadocious. I, I'm doing it and I, and I have a business consultancy and every client that we work with, you know, I'm instilling this same mantra into them. It's not just that you can be profitable and do the right thing and care on every level. You will be more profitable. <laughs> 100%. 100%. This is the new way. This is the new thing. And, and it's not, I'm not some kind of like maverick that's figured out some system to, you know, align humanitarianism and profit. The truth is just that the public discourse has changed, you know, is that uh, companies that are, you know, abusive in their practices, like I said before, and, and you know, uh, uh, obscure these abuses away from the consumer, there's nowhere to hide anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's not people, when people have a brand, you know, people see that brand as a representation of themselves now. Yeah. You know, they, they just like they were with the, you know, with the labels of kind of like Gucci, all that kind of stuff. I'm not big into that. Um, but, you know, the, people have uh, an associated identity with their, with, with, you know, with their purchasing. Uh, from your energy company, you, you'll notice now how all the energy companies have changed from being like these big kind of like, uh, you know, like BP and, and all this stuff. And now you've got the new ones are octopus and all these, you know what I mean? They're all cute and friendly and conscientious. And so this is, this is the, this is the way that consumerism is changing is that people want a brand that represents them as individuals. And generally what do people feel as individuals now? They feel that they want to be environmentally conscious. They feel that they, especially with what the business I'm concerned in, of, of course, is hair, skin, you know, color, rife with toxicity and abuses. And people, people just want transparency, you know, people, people, and, and as far as employees go, mm -hmm. I've hired, you know, we've I've had over 30, 40 staff. Um, and I've, I've historically not done that great a job of hiring people because I kind of just thought, right, you know, you can do, you'll do the job. This last time, this last round of hiring, I completely changed the way I thought about it. And the one question I asked people was, what, what are your dreams? What are your goals? You know, um, and even if I can only help you get an inch close to them, I said, I'm not going to hire you yeah. if I don't believe that your goals are aligned with my goals. 
Because if both of our goals are aligned, then I know that you're going to put everything into this. You're going to, you're going to treat it like your own business. And I want you to feel like it's your own business yeah. and, and vice versa. I know I'm giving you something back. I know that you're getting, you know, not just a paycheck, you know, not just money because it's money's just a means to survive. You know, yeah. as far as building a company goes, you know, that's where you spend so much of your life. You know, the, 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 your work colleagues become like a, your family and friends and your workplace becomes like a second home. And I just want my, my, I want my um, staff, I don't even like calling them stuff, colleagues, uh, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to take ownership, to feel this is their place. You know, this is their place. This is, they, they, they built the, you know, obviously we went into prefab factory, but metaphorically they built the bricks that built the business, you know, yeah. and that there's progression for them. You know, I hope that they'll be with me for 20, 30 years and that they'll, you know, they'll, they'll climb the ladder as I climb my own personal ladder. Do you know what I mean? And hopefully we'll be at the top together. <laughs> That's, and oh people, people respect when you treat them that way. This is so amazing that you say that because <laughs> you're literally describing how I've always felt. Whether I led on a project or whether I was a member of a team, I always felt yeah. like that. Like, be- when, I, when I was getting into media, the way I started was I first, when I was in my early 20s, I interned for a black women's magazine. And then I, while I was working five days in a hotel. I can't tell you which job Mm. I treasured more. Of course, I always wanted to work in media and that was my goal. But I really, really enjoyed being a hotel receptionist while I was a hotel receptionist. Yeah. I was like, I can give you the most, you know, fun stories Mm. because it was a place where I made my friends. Yeah. It was just, just so much joy. Do you know what the funny thing is? So, the part of the reason that my, my, kind of like I knew this is how I wanted to be um you know as a lead or whatever you want to call it uh, is because I would start jobs I didn't go to university uh, much like you didn't but I didn't go back I just stayed I stayed working and I worked as like a you know a consultant and like a sales executive for lots of different companies uh, the enthusiasm I would start 95 percent of the jobs that I would start with and then how quickly that enthusiasm would wane you know, how quickly I would feel after two months, like, okay, these people are just taking the piss. Do you know what I mean? Like, or I don't really feel like I'm getting anything out of this. Do you know what I mean? Or I'm just getting a wage. And one of the things I would hate the most is when, you know, let's say you're doing well at your job or whatever, you're a little bit late or something. And then suddenly someone comes in and they, they treat you like they own you. Right. And they're like, you know, you're being paid a wage. Duh, 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 duh. And I'm like, hang on, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> like, listen, I love analytics and I'm making you a lot more money than you're paying me. <laughs> So don't like don't you know don't start treating me like that, right? Oh, and people do. A lot of people who are older now are so confused by the younger generation. Mm. Exactly what you said. I can't tell you the number of conversations I'm having with people who feel like I really don't get what these young people want. Like mm. about a while ago, someone was saying, like they actually want to take their lunch. Don't they? <laughs> yeah, like you're not sacrificing everything for the business and every second. Yeah, it's a weird one. It's weird. <laughs> it's a good, it's actually a really good example because they've just done that four day work week in Norway. And even me as a business owner, I'm like, four day work week. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, my staff won't be able to get anything done in four days. But then, you know, they come back and they say, well, productivity is improved by like 40%. It's like, Every time they do one of these experiments, you know, like let's invest in people, let's give people the choice, let's be that it always comes back with the most incredibly positive results every time. Like <laughs> them about fail. <laughs> this is kind of an issue, isn't it? So, for example, there's imagine you're an okay for a second, try not to think like you, but you're okay. someone who's been conditioned to think of you work in finance, your your job, your first mm. objective, maximize profit. Mm-hmm. And you have this new workforce, because I've been warning of this. I've been saying, look, by 2020, it's millennials who are going to be the generation that are in power. Mm-hmm. Let's, expect, let's expect a seismic shift. Mm-hmm. We're completely not sure of where their values are, where, how they're aligned, how they see things. So I've mm-hmm. kind of been trying to, you know, educate myself about how differently they think when i went to university i was 36 when i first started so i have younger friends who so i I feel like even though i'm 44 i'm not really 44 because i've been surrounded by centennials and millennials and so i feel more prepared i know that they really want a life Mm. they want to have families that's very important to them they want to ensure that their work is meaningful that what they're doing is you know 
not making the environment worse. They hate exploitation. I think it seems to be in their DNA. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Well, do you know, do you know I, I think it's just... Um... And if there's anything that I would want to leave to the to the listeners to say, any a particular message that I think is kind of sums up what I've been trying to say, and I think you touched on it there, is let's not focus on the answers as much as we focus on the questions. I think that um, we try and define everything in modern society. We try and define ideologies. Mm-hmm. We try and define opinions. We mm-hmm. try and define whole generations, whole genders, whole race. And everybody thinks that they have an understanding of what the thoughts, the feelings, the opinions are. We are a rich ha- tapestry, this human race of difference, you know what I mean? On every single level. Um, and it's when we start trying to put each other in boxes and especially ideologies and thoughts into boxes, yeah. that's when we're, we're not moving forward and probably we're moving backwards. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, drop the isms, drop the, drop the ologies, drop, <laughs> drop, yeah. drop them all, right? Uh, and I think that that's what, that is what millennials are ch- tapping into now is just kind of a universal truth. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's not about, the answers are there. The answers are, f- are, are, are inalienable truths. That's what I come to find. Yeah. Nothing that I say about how I run my businesses is like my theory, right? This is not, I've not, this is nothing, you know, it's like science, you know, science is, is nobody really invents anything, right? They only discover it. And, and I really, 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 really do believe that just as we open our eyes, we open our hearts. I don't want to sound too like a heavy liberal or whatever, but you know, I mean it. Mm-hmm. Um, we will come to learn that the answers are, the answers are universal truths, you know?